All right, uh, so Margaret Keane um, is our next speaker, and she's a former emergency room nurse, a mother, and proud grandmother. She's here to have her experience of being a spouse and primary caregiver of someone who lived with and died of cancer. So we welcome Margaret. Let's give her a warm hand. So good afternoon. So she took my first line, which is, I'm here today to share with you my experience as a spouse and primary caregiver of someone who lived with and died of cancer. Now, first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Gary, my husband of 42 years. He was a career military man, and his, first, his last posting to Bosnia as a peacekeeper was what ended his career early at the 29 years of service. While serving there, he picked up a virus that attacked the macula of both his eyes and caused cerebral vasculitis. In 1994, he was declared unfit for service, being legally blind and suffering from recurring mini strokes. The condition he was diagnosed with was acute multifocal placoid pigment epitheliopathy with cerebral vasculitis. To control this, he was put on high daily 100 milligram doses of prednisone. We knew being on prednisone could not continue for the long term, so it was decided to try methotrexate to control his vasculitis. The eyes were permanently damaged and our new reality was living with this visual disability, but we needed to minimize the potential damage from the strokes. He had few long-lasting deficits from the strokes. He did have annoying things like restless leg syndrome, weight gain from the prednisone, which in turn contributed to his hiatus hernia and abdominal wall hernia requiring surgery, a very annoying and painful peripheral neuropathy. Gary fought depression for two years. It was a very difficult transition for an analytical perfectionist to give up his career in the armed forces in construction engineering to try and find a new life with a disability at the age of 48. Now I share this with you as we feel the long-term use of methotrexate, which can cause lymphomas and leukemias, contributed to Gary being struck with MDS unclassified 15 years later. It accounts for about 1% of all leukemias. So for the last 17 to 18 years of Gary's life, he got on with things. He continued to golf regularly with the help of very devoted friends. He got a guide dog, Brandy, who enriched his life to the max. This was someone that he could count on, but more importantly, someone who needed him. He took on learning all the new computer aids available and did all the banking online. He still cut the grass and didn't get upset when I would redo the spots he missed. Not being able to drive was a big hardship for him. And he did say not being able to see the faces of his new daughters-in-law and grandchildren were distressing to him. One good thing was he never saw me age. <laughs> Winters were very hard for both him and for Brandy. We didn't live close to a bus stop and walking on the snowy, icy sidewalks was dangerous. We decided to try Florida, and Gary was in his element there. He could golf and ride a three-wheeled bike around the complex, and he had some freedom. Okay. <laughs> the picture I have here was taken in Florida three weeks before his diagnosis. His symptoms started about a month before when I noticed extensive bruising and bloody drool on the pillows. He also had an acetone odor on his breath and blood blisters in his mouth. Being a nurse, I immediately thought of liver problems from the long-term methotrexate use, or maybe diabetes. I checked his blood sugar a few times and it was normal, so I then had him abstain from alcohol. That's not easy to do in the Florida lifestyle. He came home from golf one day and said he was unable to finish walking a nine because he felt weak and lightheaded. That was my cue to head for home and medical care. We arrived home after two and a half days on the road and headed straight to UH Emerge. That was March the 14th. I later learned that his hemoglobin had been 54. No wonder he was a little lightheaded. 
His white blood count, 94, platelets, less than 10. That night we were told he probably had acute myeloid, myeloid leukemia and he was admitted for transfusions and then transferred the next day to Fick, Vic, Victoria Hematology Oncology. The bone marrow results seemed to be inconclusive, so we had to wait until two weeks later to get the true diagnosis. It was excruciating for me as I needed to know the specifics, but Gary was leaving all the worrying to me. When we had our appointment at the oncologist at the cancer clinic, our time of living with cancer began in earnest. At this appointment, the oncologist seemed almost upbeat when he told us he had one patient who was still alive two years after diagnosis of MDS unclassified. That is what Gary grasped onto. I grasped onto the fact that it was with continual chemotherapy, two weeks on, two weeks off, of sub-Q injections of Videza. The weeks off, he would still need to come for blood work and transfusions, and of course, the once a month appointments. To me, it was a death sentence. To Gary, it was hope of two more years with his, with his family and friends. I knew that this diagnosis of cancer had just taken over every aspect of both of our lives. We were given our schedule and it was daunting to say the least. But before we could get started the next week, Gary had an emergency with his spleen. It was the size of a football and it had infarcted. He was in terrible pain and I had to call an ambulance to get him to the hospital. It was a difficult 13 hour wait until it was decided what service would take him. <coughs> Surgery didn't want to touch him due to his risk and his diagnosis. Hematology really didn't know what to do with his spleen, but finally hematology agreed to admit him, try to get his numbers better so surgery could take out his spleen. One week after admission, he went to the OR for a splenectomy. That was a Saturday night at seven o'clock. He did amazingly well post-op, except they couldn't get a center line out due to his low platelets, and they sent him home five days later with C. difficile. Good thing I'm a nurse or he would have been right back there. There also was a mix-up with home care and we were three days before anyone came to do post-op care. Gary was confident that I could take care of him, so there was never a question of going back to the hospital for the next seven months, we never did. We did have one short ER visit when we were sent there by the cancer clinic, but it was not our choice. So now we're into May with no treatment yet. Gary's trying to live his life with shortness of breath leg swelling and dizziness. How much is post-op recovery and how much is disease? This is when Veterans Affairs got fully involved to augment CCAC with mobility aids, dietary counseling, physio and OT for his post-op care. They also paid for hospital parking, mileage and a meal allowance if we were at the uh, cancer clinic over lunch. The average reimbursement was for $350 a month. How fortunate were we? So this is the schedule that we were given for the first month therapy at the cancer clinic. This is when I started reading and researching everything that I could get my hands on. I was online every evening and reading literature given out by the Lymphoma and Leukemia Society, books written about living with cancer, books written about dying with cancer, anything and everything about palliative care because I knew that's where we were headed. The online sites that I found most helpful were the ones that correlated blood work results with life expectancy. Using the IPSS score, and that's for um, MDS, I estimated that Gary had six months to one year to live. When I asked the oncologist outright, quoting the chart, he confirmed my calculations. I'm not sure why it was so important for me, but I needed a plan. The other form online that was most helpful was the one that had entries from patients themselves and their caregivers. I found it to be honest and so relatable. It just confirmed what I was thinking and feeling. Then there was the book. It was titled Just Stay. It is written by three healthcare professionals for the from the London area. 
Jennifer is a regional manager with the Southwest CCAC and she journals her experience with the diagnosis, treatment and death of her husband with pancreatic cancer. It is the perfect mix of teamwork with the support of the cancer clinic, palliative care, a home visiting nurse practitioner and a spiritual care practitioner with LRCP. They were all there for her for two years of his illness. I wanted this for us. I needed this for us. So I decided to ask for it in August when I found that after three months of treatment, there was no sign of improvement and the three painful sub-Q injections each day were taking a toll on quality of life for Gary. I asked the nurse at our oncologist's office if we could have a referral to palliative care and was curtly told that that's for the last week of life. And you're not there yet. It was one of the lowest points of this so far. I was made to feel that I had given up on Gary and how dare I. I was looking for someone to help manage his side effects and also to help us prepare for the difficult decisions that were surely coming. I later wondered if the nurse was thinking of hospice palliative care. But CCAC were long out of the picture since Gary's recovery from surgery had been their only focus. So where was Gary's GP in all of this? Gary had had such bad luck with GPs through no fault of his. When released from the military, he had always been covered by the DND physicians. The first doctor he found after a few years left his practice to do something else. The second, after a few years, left due to a medical issue. And the third left due to a licensing issue. Gary had had good relationships with each of these doctors and it was very difficult to have to start over with his complicated story each time. We relied a lot on his specialists who were so very kind. When Gary was diagnosed with leukemia, his present GP had only seen him for medication orders and some blood work reviews. There really hadn't been time to establish any kind of a personal relationship. So when we went to see him about the most painful side effects of the injections, the scalding at the injection sites, the generalized itching, red, red raised rash, leg twitching, etc., etc., his answer to us was, not sure what you expect, you are on chemo. I don't think he realized this chemo was our only lifeline and we had to find a way to live with it. He also said in a kind way, <coughs> that a little suffering was good for all of us. So there was no help here. So in September, it was starting to get to Gary. He was having trouble getting through nine holes of golf, even with a cart. He was short of breath, had headaches, and was unsteady on his feet. He was showing signs of defeat with sadness, insomnia, anorexia. So after collaboration with our adult sons, we decided to ask to stop the injections, knowing full well that it meant he would die very soon. Sure wish we had some support here. Our visit with the oncologist, though, did not go as planned. He said that we needed to give the drug six months, and that wasn't up until October. Then we would do another bone marrow and see how it was working. We felt that he was ignoring the obvious. Still no offer of palliative care. After Gary's last chemo in September, he needed both blood and platelets, so that meant another five hours in the clinic. So I left to clear my head, get a change of scenery, while Gary slept through his transfusions. I went over to the main cafeteria, and in line ahead of me was a nurse that I had worked with 20 years ago in the ER. I asked her what she was doing now, and she was an inpatient palliative nurse. While standing in line, I told her my story and she took my phone number. How fortuitous. I then asked at the clinic to speak to a social worker. She gave moral support and gave me her number for the next time we spoke with the doctor, she would come and help us plead our case. On return home, I went for a walk and stopped in to see a new neighbor who I understood to have a role with palliative outreach. She told me I could self-refer to CCAC palliative care. Now I had some options. The next morning I called CCAC and got the ball rolling. 
Then that same day, I got a call from Dr. Hamilton's office nurse to set up an appointment. That was because of my colleague, Leanne. Within two days, we had our home visit from Dr. Hamilton, who's a visiting palliative physician and his resident. We had O2 delivered, a hospital bed, and oral morphine. My load had been lifted. Someone else cared and was acting on it. I noticed a big difference in Gary. He was back to pushing himself to go out with friends, be part of family get-togethers, and take whatever good life was going to give. I think it was because we now had some control over the itching, restless legs, generalized discomfort, shortness of breath, and insomnia. We had visits from out-of-town friends, and Gary put on a good front for all of them. The October oncology appointment was our last. As we were leaving, Gary shook the doctor's hand and thanked him for his care. The doctor was uncomfortable and said, I'll see you next month. Really, I thought. I knew that we would be keeping Gary at home because that was what he wanted. Not only did I have the support of CCAC palliative team, but I had very good friends who were also retired eMERGE nurses who were there day and night if needed. I wondered, how would he die? Would it be a GI bleed or a rectal bleed? A massive stroke with his white cells over 100 clogging up his blood or a massive MI? The palliative nurse gave me ideas on how, how to handle all of these scenarios. When Gary could no longer take the oral morphine, the palliative nurse put in a line so I could give the drugs when needed. She encouraged me not to hold back and to keep him comfortable. Three days before Gary died, he went to the golf course for one last beer. He didn't drink it. He got my gloves regripped, though. Two days before he died, with my help supporting him physically, he blew all the leaves off the patio. That was the last time he was out of the house. Gary died from respiratory failure in his own bedroom with his family present on October 23rd, 10 days after his 67th birthday and 15 days after our 42nd anniversary. Throughout this process, Gary received 50 units of blood and blood products. And now our younger son donates every three weeks to honor his dad. So I guess if there's anything to be taken away from this, it is that even when you have all the resources and knowledge of the system, you can still fall through the cracks. Palliative support at the onset of such a devastating diagnosis would have made it all so much easier. And I feel this should be offered, if not from the cancer clinic, then by the family doctor. It cannot come too soon. When it all comes together, it works very well. And now I choose to focus on all the good things that happened to us throughout this most painful time. Thank you.